Let's start with the title. On page 2289, Love Song of J. Alfred Pufok is already a juxtaposition. Love Song is something that's very melodic, not only in what it represents, but just the pronouncement of it. J. Alfred Pufrock has hard consonants, and that's a juxtaposition of the hard versus the soft immediately in the title. So T.S. Eliot is brilliant at doing this, setting up these juxtapositions in almost every single line. The deal that you need to do as a reader of J. Alfred Prufrock is you need to figure out what is being signified by these juxtapositions. Okay, so if we start with the epigraph, the epigraph is in Italian, as we were just talking about, and I don't read Italian. I read French, Spanish. Anybody else read Italian out there? Maybe when we come back to class on Thursday, you can help us with it. And the, it translates, the epigraph translates into, if I thought that my reply would be to one who would ever return to the world, this flame would stay without further movement. But since none, oh, I missed it. But since, but since none has ever returned alive from this depth, if what I hear is true, I answer you without fear of infamy. And it's from Dante's Inferno. And it's the moment the footnote says, um, when um, uh, Guido Montefeltro, shut up in his flame, the punishment given to false counselors, tells the shame of his evil life to Dante because he believes Dante will never return to earth to report it. So you have to ask yourself the question, if this, if this is the opening quote for this particular poem, it's a literary allusion, um, then what in particular is, who's going to be the speaker here? Is it Dante Alighieri himself? Or is it going to be this guy Guido? Um, is it a confession? Is it traditionally what we'd call an apologia in which there's an explanation of one's life, not necessarily an apology? Immediately with that first line, we get a first person speaker. Remember, we refer to the person who's talking in a poem as a speaker, not a narrator. Let us go then, you and I. Immediately, you as the reader are incorporated into the group or the couple. You're not let to just read and experience this poem you've become part of it. You've become complicit to it. When the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. When the evening is spread out against the sky, vast sky, you might think we're about to go to something that's contemplative, symbolic of the end of a life, a sunset. And then we move to a very medicalized uh, image right after that. And it's in a simile format. You have to watch out for those metaphors and similes here. Like a patient etherized upon a table. What in particular does that mean? It's about to have surgery? Somebody who's not dreaming? Because when you're etherized, you're cut off from yourself and from your body. And who's looking at this person? And is it the speaker thinking that I'm both spread out in the sky and representative of the sunset of my life? Or is that uh, I'm, I'm a piece of medical marvel that's being put to sleep unnaturally by drugs and technology? Let us go through certain half-deserted streets. So we've got a city again. The muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. The muttering retreats of restless nights. It's that image of insomnia. This is not going to be a happy poem. In one night, cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. So we start to get an end rhyme scheme. It's not necessarily going to be consistent throughout. Streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Think about that image for just a moment. Streets that follow like a tedious argument, twists and turns, and nobody's ever right, and it's unending, and eventually you get lost, and it's scary. It's of insidious intent, so there's something nefarious about it. To lead you, reader, you, to an overwhelming question. And it's the question that's going to govern the rest of this poem. Oh, do not ask, what is it? Let us go and visit. 
So the speaker is encouraging you guys as the reader not to figure it out, but in fact, returning to something like what Keats was telling us to do, to go, experience, see it. It's not going to be good. Right? The images that we just got, that whole thing had to do with somnambulance, had to do insomnia, had to do with sleeping and interrupted and unnatural sleeping. Those are the images that, that we get so far. There's no individual. There's no body. We got it all about the body in the Romantic and the Victorian period. But here we've gone so internalized into the psychology of the individual. And then suddenly we go to something else. It's still a space, too. You see that. In the room, the women come and go. Speaking of Michelangelo. Well, who's Michelangelo? A great artist? Why are these women talking about them? There's not going to be an explanation of it but we're going to have a refrain of that repeat two stanzas later. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes. It sounds like a cat. The yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes. Well, that sounds like a dog. Licked its tongue into the corners of the evening. Lingered upon the pools that stand in drains. Let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys. Slipped by the terrace. Made a sudden leap and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. It's an animal embracing a structure, but it's smoke and it's fog, something that you can't see through, but that it reflects light. So it's never something direct. And indeed there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides upon the street, along the street rubbing its back upon the window panes. There will be time, there will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. There will be time to murder and create, and time for all the works and days of hands. So we're talking about humanity and society, and I just mentioned that, this idea that modern humanity also represents self-struggle and some hopelessness. That lift and drop a question on your plate. Time for you and time for me. And time yet for a hundred indecisions and for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of a toast and tea. So tea and toast is ceremonial, but it's also at a very particular time of the day. But before that, he juxtaposes that against a hundred indecisions, a hundred visions and revisions. So it's just continuous. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo, again. This is where the lyricism come in, comes in. This is why it's a song. It's continued. And indeed, there will be time to wonder, do I dare and do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. I don't know anybody who would be happy about the bald spot in the middle of your hair, but it's also a movement of time. And this is what we're going to see come up in Mrs. Dalloway, the insubstantiability of time, meaning that time isn't necessarily always linear. But here it seems J. Alfred Prufrock has aged before us, but do we know that he started with us as a young man? So we don't have time moving forward or moving backwards. We have a moving sideways and crossways and downways and all over the place. So this poem is not meant to be a narration because narration moves forward in logical lockstep. So we have to let go of that for this poem. They will say how his hair is growing thin. My morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest but asserted by a simple pin. They will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. You notice that there's parentheticals, and it's the crowd out there that's saying these kinds of things in the parentheticals. It's not J. Alfred Prufrock, and he doesn't react to them. He incorporates them into the way that he just speaks. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions, which a minute will reverse. Again, we return to this image of time and decisions. It seems like a lack of control by humanity over time. 
For I've known them all, already known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. I've measured out my life with coffee spoons. Hmm. Why coffee spoons? Think about it. Ritual in the morning, every morning. Right? I know the voice is dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. So how should I presume? And it continues on in a couple of stanzas, and I want to actually skip down to, to line 75. And the afternoon, had the sun back on. And the afternoon, the evening sleeps so peacefully, smoothed by long fingers, asleep, dot, 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 tired, dot, 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 or it malingers. It doesn't just linger, it malingers. Stretch on the floor here beside you and me. Should I, after tea and cakes and ices, again we return to these rituals of eating and consumption. Have the strength to force the moment to its crisis. And I just interrupted myself in a moment where it was very intimate where the two of them are lying on the floor. But though I have wept and fasted and wept and prayed, though I have seen my head grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter. I am no prophet, and here's no great matter. So J. Alfred Prufrock is our, pro is our poet. So this is exactly what um, T.S. Eliot is talking about when he's talking about the tradition and individual talent. That it's the quotidian, it's the daily. This is what Blast was talking about. That the common and everyday man can be, can be king. So here, J. Alfred Prufrock is our king. But he's not a prophet. And he's not a god. He's just a man. I've seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I've seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker. And in short, I was afraid. This should remind you of Jane Eyre in the way it was retrospective. So J. Alfred Prufrock is not actually giving us his life as it's laid out. He's almost stepping back as a spectator, and so are you, but you're also compelled to be part of whatever it is that he's going on about. Right? And so with that, I'm going to stop here.